Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to introduce you to what I believe is the most exciting thing announced in .NET 8's .NET Conf and that is .NET Aspire. Now .NET Aspire is a bit unique because it wasn't actually developed in the public alongside the rest of .NET but for the past six months or so it is something that Microsoft has been doing in private and they just announced it to the public. However, I did have private access to it for a month or so before its release and had enough time to let it soak in, play around with it, see what it can and cannot do and in this video I'm going to bring everything together and just introduce you to the tech but I have way way more videos coming to show you what cool things you can do with this amazing tech. If you like the content and you want to see more make sure you subscribe for more training check out my courses on dometrain.com. Okay so what is .NET Aspire? Well let's see what Microsoft is saying. It is an opinionated cloud ready stack for building observable production ready distributed applications and this is very much something for distributed apps and cloud native apps. It's not something that everybody absolutely will use but if you're building distributed apps this will solve a a lot of your pain points and problems. In fact, as I'm going to be showcasing Aspire, you might be reminded of another thing that rings a bell, which might be Project Tie. Now, Project Tie was an experiment from Microsoft, and a lot of the learnings of that project came into .NET Aspire. You can think of Aspire as a superset over Tie, but without any of the deployment stuff. Now, the biggest issue we have when we do distributed applications is we have many small apps and chunks, and we want to get them all to talk to each other, both when we build them locally on the developer environment, but also when we deploy them. Aspire aims to solve all that. You can have a large number of services and it shouldn't be a pain point to get this database to talk to this thing or you know, this app to talk to this cache or this. Everything should be very, very easy to implement and get together. I'm going to show you a very simple example that actually Microsoft has also showcased but aim to do a better and more honest and not so sales pitchy job explaining it. I think the best way to understand Aspire is by actually showing you how we can use it. So let's go straight into that. Now before that, real quick, I'd like to let you know that our Black Friday discount on DomeTrain.com is now live. You have until the 27th of November to use discount code BLACKFRIDAY23 to get 40% off any of the courses and 20% off any of the already discounted bundles. So this is your once a year opportunity to invest in your learning and learn anything you need to thrive as a .NET developer from unit testing, integration testing, we have clean architecture, DDD, Check out our courses, link down below, use code BLACKFRIDAY2023. And two things, our EF core is not included because it just launched, so that just gets 20%. And the code will only last for 500 purchases per course, so you might want to hurry. This discount has actually been in early access for some days now to my Patreons and our mail list, so make sure you subscribe to our mail list as well if you're going to get these early accesses to discount codes. Now back to the video. Okay, so let me show what I have here. I have two applications. I have a weather app web, which is a Blazor application, and then I have a weather app API. If I just quickly run the API to show you what this is and then run the Blazor app as well, just to give you an idea of how it all comes together. Here I have my weather app. It's your bog standard weather forecast app, nothing fancy here just gives five random weathers by default. And then what I can also do is I can run this web project, this Blazor web project, and this project is just a default template project but has been configured to actually talk to that API to get that weather. So when I go to weather here, everything you see here is coming from that API and I can actually quickly prove that over here because I can go to the API, I can decrease the information log level and if I save and I go and I call it a few more times then you can see all those requests going to the API and not staying in the Blazor app. Now let's take a quick look at how all this comes together. What I have here is a weather API client that knows how to call that endpoint and return that weather forecast model and then in my pages I have the weather and at the bottom I'm using that client by injecting it from over here to get the weather and then display it. And that is it. Now, if I go into the program.cs, that's how my client is configured. So I have one dependency to that other API and I have to somehow point to where that API lives. Now, maybe you don't use this approach. Maybe you wanna move this base address to your app settings. So you could have, for example, over here, weather API base address and you could load that property from here that is besides the point that doesn't change with aspire i'll just leave it as it is here to make everything come together nicely but know that this could be something you load from app settings and you could have one app settings for development for production for staging and so on now when you have services coming together especially in a local environment it is very hard to know where everything is running so i had to go here and be like okay there's this profile over here which has the http version but if i want https then i have two options and one 
of them is this and one of them is this and then IIS and like you have so much going on here that yes you maybe can nail everything down the first time but then as things change they can get out of sync they can break so Aspire aims to solve all that how well by changing the way these apps are running together as a system because remember when i want to debug my system as a system here i have to debug the api debug the web run them at the same time and then make sure everything is connected ready healthy resilient and so on so let's bring in aspire to see what problem it is solving now one thing i want to mention before i move on is that i will be using visual studio to install aspire and show you how you can create an Aspire project, however, you don't need to. You can actually do everything I'm going to do from Visual Studio through the CLI. And Rider, by the way, will get support for Aspire as well. Uh, the way to install Aspire without Visual Studio is to just do a, a .NET workload update to update your .NET workload, and then do a .NET workload install Aspire, and this will install the Aspire workload on your machine, and you will be able to then do .NET new Aspire, and that will create an Aspire project. Now, in Visual Studio, you're going to have to modify your installation, and you're going to have to choose Aspire SDK, which is in preview, by the way, over here to install the necessary templates and so on. So let's jump in Visual Studio and go ahead on the solution and say that I want to add a new project and I'm going to search for Aspire. Now, Aspire is a project type. You can get a starter application, which installs a few things by default, which is actually what I'm showing you here, but I want to show you the process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say .NET Aspire application over here and say next and then give it a name i'm going to say that this is the weather app dot aspire and it's going to live there create a new folder then next and then i'm going to use dotnet 8 and say create now by default we're going to get two projects this app host project which is going to be used to run our distributed system the two applications we have and then the service defaults which have this single extension.cs class over here which configures a lot of the defaults for how aspire will operate which everything in there you can change by the way now let's take a look at the aspire host over here as you can see we don't have the web application anymore we have the distributed application if you see the type of the project this is just an sdk normal microsoft.net.sdk project but it uses aspire hosting and is aspire host true which makes it the aspire project type that it is now i can if i want to work with this in a manual way so i can start working with aspire and implementing the configuration for the app host manually on how to run my apps but i won't do that what i'm going to do instead is i'm going to use the vs tooling which is pretty cool actually and i can't wait for rider to also have it to add aspire support to my applications so first what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to the web project the blazor app and i'm going to say right click add aspire orchestrator support and it's going to say that hey we already have orchestration because you already have this project so i'm going to use this app host project and the service defaults to configure everything by default for you and i'm going to say yes please do that for me the moment i do that if we go back to the app host what happened is now we have this weather app add project so the app host is aware that i want to run some web project and that exists in this project's namespace dot weather app aspire or weather app defaults so the moment you add a reference to this app host it will show here as a project this is not the only thing that changed by the way in my program.cs in my web app we now also have this add service defaults call which will add all the service defaults from that service defaults project so this is the extension method that is going to be called and there's plenty of things here we're going to take a look at them in a second but also all the way to the bottom we have this map default endpoints some endpoints needed for aspire to just orchestrate everything and function and that is it now i will do the same for the api itself so i'm kind of going to do again is right click on the api and say add .NET aspire orchestrator support and as you're going to see now this will also get a reference to the api so sorry this would actually be the front end and this should be the weather api and now i have both my projects here added and not only that my api itself also have the service defaults and so on now i won't need any more of the vs tooling and all that could actually be done manually by you if you wanted to so i'm going to go back to rider now so as you can see all that still works on rider nothing is vs specific they made it in a way where the id tooling is just complementary and everything is driven by references and newbie packages now what i want to do is i want to get actually a reference to the api project because i can i can say var api equals this and then i can go to my front end and i can say with reference to the api and that will help with the wiring app of 
the web project being aware that the API exists. And now with all of that wired up, what I want to do is I want to go back to the web project and I want to say that, hey, I actually don't need to refer to this now by its address. What I can do is I can say that, hey, this is just the weather API and that name matches the name over here. So you can move this to a const if you want and then reuse it across everything so you don't have magic strings and so on. I would recommend that. But now you can actually refer to things as they are named in the app host and you don't have to know exactly where they live on what address they're running on. They will just work. And all that magic, by the way, is not that much magic as you think. It all steps on the configuration framework, environment variables and so on. So with that, what I can do now is I can just say, hey, just run the app host. So I'm running this Aspire project over here, not the individual apps, but the app host, which knows how to run my whole distributed application, distributed system. And when I do that, what I get is this, the Aspire dashboard. So here I can see my front end and my API. I can run them if I want. So I can say, go to the endpoints and I can see the app. This all still returns as it should. And as you're going to see, I can also run the weather API if I want to. And as you're going to see, I have some great things here. First, I can see environment variables. So all these environment variables are loaded from the framework. Many of them are open telemetry ones. Some of them are logging and so on. You can customize and inject your own. Then we can see logs. So I can sort the front end and see the real time logs of those applications and over here, the console itself. And I can actually even go here and see containers. We're going to see that in a second, executables and also structured logs. So for a request, I can go here and say, view the details of this log and I can see span details, everything. And you can do things like filtering as well. So message contains, filter here, filter by app and so on. It is so, so cool. And not only that, you can go into traces because all of that by default is instrumented with open telemetry, which is an open standard. So any type of app that supports the standard will work. And I can go here and see, for example, this first weather request, I can save you and I can see, oh, the API request took 74 milliseconds, but then the HTTP get request for the front end took 200 and so on. And I can go and here and click the individual trace, see how much everything took. It's so, so good that you get this by default. You can even go to metrics. So you can select a service, let's say the weather API, and then you have the last five, 10 minutes, 15, whatever, an hour. And you can see things like JIT compilation time or the size of the objects on the garbage collector over time. You can see things like the methods compiled count and so on. So as your app is being used, you can see all this observability and tracking and you didn't have to manually change any of that yourself. It is just there and it is customizable, but it's using open and latest standards to have implemented. Now, let's say I want to go a step further and I want to add output caching to that weather view because the weather is not likely it's going to change within a five second gap. So let's say I want to cache that page for five seconds, but I don't want to do that with an in-memory cache because remember, I'm building a distributed application. So for that reason, I'm going to use Redis cache and I'm going to run it in a container. So what I can do is I can actually go to the app host and I can say just by default that, hey, I want a cache over here. It's going to be builder dot add Redis container, which they add by default because they know Redis is a standard for distributed caching. So they add support for it by default. And I'm going to say Redis cache over here. And now I have the cache and that cache will go to the project. So I'm going to say with reference to that cache, which means I can now go to the web project and go to NuGet packages and set for aspire dot Redis, and I'm going to use this output caching Redis package over here. These are Microsoft maintained Aspire packages that bring all the things you need with the best practices by default together. And they just give you an extension method to wire up and use. So I'll go here and just say, add the output caching one. And now I will go to the program.cs and say builder dot add Redis output cache. I'm going to, of course, give it a connection string name, which here as you can imagine, it is actually the name of the Aspire defined container. So we're going to move here, just paste this over here, configure nothing else. I could if I want to, but I don't want to, I don't need to. And then I go all the way down and after the map endpoints, I'm going to say use output cache. And then I will go and introduce the caching to the page. So go to the weather 
and say attribute output cache, which is a .NET 8 thing. And then I'm going to say duration is five seconds. So this page will be cached for five seconds on Redis. Now I want to point out, I'm not running any container in Docker. I just said add a container. And now all I'm going to do is say run the app host. And now as this is running, as you're going to see, not only the apps will start, but a Docker container for Redis will also start. And you can see it over here, this Redis container using the latest Redis version, which by the way, you can override if you want. It is now running. And here in my dashboard, I no longer just have the front end and the weather app, but in containers, I also have the Redis cache. And by the way, I can see them consolidating these three views to a single one because it doesn't really make sense to have them separate. But now if I go to the front end and say, go to weather, as you're going to see, the weather is cached for one, two, three, four, five seconds. And now if I click again, it's going to be new weather, cached for five seconds, and all that caching is happening in Redis. So if I go to Aspire, and I can actually prove this with traces, which I now have, you'll see that the first request over here goes to the weather API, but all the next ones within five seconds don't. That's why you do have the weather forecast call to the API and also a set X to set the Redis value in the Redis container. So you have the full observability stack over here, including containers and Redis and everything by default, because there is instrumentation in Aspire packages or how they call them components. But I can also prove that, hey, there is no request going to the weather API and it all goes to Redis because now I can see that there's a Redis get happening over here and it's happening really, really fast, as you can see over here. It is incredibly cool. We're getting so much out of the box just by default and you can customize everything you're seeing. If you're excited for this and you want to see more, please subscribe because I have way, way more content for Aspire. The last thing I want to show you as part of this showcase is actually how you would deploy an application like this. And Microsoft did the very smart thing of not dealing with it. Ty, one of the biggest criticisms was that it was trying to deal with deployment and that was very tricky because everyone has a different way of deploying. Well, in Aspire, Microsoft said, we're going to give you a way to consume how your app comes together, but we're not going to tell you how you will deploy it. We won't deal at all with that. The way they do that is as follows. I'm going to go and CD into the app host over here, and I'm going to say .NET run publisher, and the publisher I want to run is the manifest, and I want the output path to be just manifest.json. Here we go. So this will now run what's called the manifest publisher to generate a manifest.json file over here, which then describes how everything comes together in my application from resources. As you can see, I'm using a Redis cache. I'm using the weather API of type project. The path is here in case you want to point to the CS proj to get that in order to deploy and build and so on. You have open telemetry configuration as environment variables. You have bindings, you have schemes, you have your front end, you have everything defined over here, including the HTTP weather API or the bindings, which are just environment variables, which you can override if you want to. So it's magic, but it's a very high level magic. You can actually tap into and change in any way you want. I think the project is insanely amazing. There's tons of things I haven't showed you and I will show you. So please do subscribe to see more. And I can't wait to see how far Microsoft can take this because I think there's a bright future ahead of us for us building distributed applications. But now I want to know from you, what do you think about this project? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching and as always, Keep coding.